Hello, my name is uh, Suman Banerjee. I'm from Steel's Institute of Technology. This is a paper with Ronald Masulis, who has empirical papers saying world class shares are bad, but we are kind of exploring a new road to showing that dual class shares uh, may not be that bad. It's not as revolutionary as uh, the last paper, but I really enjoyed it. And uh, let's think about, I want to skip this because we have seen Google too many times today. <laughs> and you know, I, 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 I did not foresee this. I might have used something else. But it, at the same time, that you know, if, I, if you talk to uh, people, uh, company people, they are very supportive of dual class. But when it talk, comes to academician and uh, legal minds, they are more in problems with 12 class. So this is what I tried to show in this. You know, the uh, objective of this paper is to further understand. We are trying to understand the link between the ownership structure, governance, and the investment decisions. What I thought is missing in this literature I will a uh, little bit give you an overview is that if you restrict a group of people, and these people are powerful people, they are going to have some reaction to your action. And this reaction has not been modeled in the, you know, the, the literature that goes into explaining uh, how, how this thing is going to evolve, valuations of shareholders' welfare. So essentially, we are arguing that you know, these are managers who takes important decisions within the farm, you suddenly impose an external regulations on them, you pressurize the you know, uh, regulatory bodies to put the regulations on them, and they are not naive people, they are very clever, they understand law, so they are going to react to your regulations, and the reactions might be sometimes even worse than if you had allowed them to be bad in the first place. So that's what we're saying. You know, prime literature concludes that dual class structures leads to low efficiency in the market for corporate control, and we, within this framework, kind of show that that's true. You know, it's true that uh, we, we if, you, if you hold the investment decision constant, we get back all the results that Grossman and Hart, or Harris and Raviv, uh, or Bebchuk and Jingalis has got. So we, we kind of go back to this inefficiency result. The impact of separation of voting rights on farms' in investment decisions has not been analyzed. We analyze a farm facing a potential takeover threat. This is very important. It's a potential takeover threat from a rival farm with a manager controlling shareholders. We develop a theory in rational contracting. So this is a rational contracting environment with control rates. <laughs> The main intuition, when a manager owns a, a voting shares, the farm issues non-voting shares to finance a scale expanding, a reasonably large investment opportunity. Uh, the manager suffers dilution of his or her ownership positions. This increases the risk that the manager can lose control of the farm, reduces unexpected private benefits of control, and expected wealth. That's the standard criticism of what we have heard so far. Debt does not necessarily solve this underinvestment problem. Because you know, often take carries with its risk of bankruptcy, consequently loss of control, and due to violation, covenant violation. If you look at the recent you know keynote speech by Oliver Hart, who was one of the main authors in this literature, Hart and Grossman, he said that debt nowadays violent covenant violation is the main source of of debt-related frictions rather than actual default. As a consequence, the managers may forego some positive NPV projects in order to protect his control rights, underinvestment can be extremely costly for the existing shareholders and reduces future dividends. And we ask the question, can non-voting shares play a positive role? Well, of course, you know, non-voting shares are not, you know, simple things or they are not like all positive things. So we look, we list the potential cost and benefits of non-voting shares. The benefits are that it allows without changing the the priority rules, you know, without changing priority rules or any tax implications, it allows farms to raise capital uh, in the form of equity and without, you know, diluting the manager's control. So, and without issuing more debt, which can restrict stricter covenants. Hence, the non-voting shares can help to alleviate the underinvestment problem that we model. And also, issuance of non-voting shares raises the takeover premium of the existing voting shares. So, the existing owners, forget about the future owners, the existing owners, conditional on a takeover, 
I mean, that beat is lower, as I said, in our model as well. Conditional on a takeover beat, we show that the takeover premiums are higher for the existing shareholders. Potential uh, benefits, uh, sorry, potential cost of, I just copied the top, so, put, <laughs> so there are some, uh, this is potential cost of non-voting shares is dividend dilution. You are issuing large number of shares because the voting premium is not priced. And another is what we talked about so far is management entrenchment, which is basically you can think about senility, you know, the reduction in efficiency, or you can think about just somebody else who could have done better with these assets without, you know, having control for the manager's quality to begin with. Main results. The issuance of non-voting equity can be optimal. Where the benefits of high investor output is the cost of marginal entrenchment and significant dividend dilution. So, you know, this is the, I mean, I've already said this, but it's very important. It's trying to say that it's not that easy to see this benefit. You know, this, this, this underinvestment is not that easy to see. And I will show you why it's not. We obtain conditions under which it is optimal for the farm to issue non-voting shares for both outside shareholders and the incumbent. So, see, remember, this is a free choice. The manager, the incumbent, all has say in choice. So the incumbent can choose whether I will ch take the uh, uh, dual class or non-voting shares or voting shares to finance an investment, so issue equity. Similarly, the outside shareholders, they can allow him or not allow him through the charter in the which has been built up. And similarly, you know, it essentially it's, it's not really that somebody is imposing something on them. So it's a free choice. So no conspiracies here. The model produces new empirical predictions regarding some of the predictions that are being tested here. So I will incorporate some of these predictions that our model makes by looking at the papers that I was exposed to. The past empirical studies. I'll say, that, you know, I, I picked up one of my co-authors. So this is Masuli, Swang, and ZJ 2009 uses dual class companies to examine how divergence between insiders cash flow and control rights affects the extraction of private benefits. They find that the divergence in rights become larger, average acquisition announcement return falls, average CEO compensation level rises. But interestingly, one point, they have omitted, they have not really focused on their paper. If you think about the Rene Etel paper, Schlingman, and their paper, they find actual larger acquisition, larger car. The larger car compared to the size. Now, wh when they say it's less, when they make a comparable sample, by some, you know, I'm, I'm a theorist, uh, some propensity score matching or something which I, I exactly cannot decipher uh, what's going on, but then they find that this car is, is relatively lower compared to these guys. But if you just unconditionally look at the tables, you'll be surprised to see that compared to the Rene, Slangerman, and uh, paper, they show higher takeover premiums. A typical, so my, my quote, I convinced him that this is something, you know, is interesting. So the typical publicly traded firm starts, so I'm, I mean, I'm trying to model this. I might not, I have three places, thank you, so whichever I go to, <laughs> and uh, Benny says time is over, the next thank you is the extension that I'll ask. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly complicated model, but, you know, I'll try to explain as much as possible. So we have four four agents in the system. One is the incumbent manager, who I'm assuming represents the current uh, farm, existing outside shareholders, uh, potential new investors, and potential rival managers. See, this potential means they're drawn from the distribution. We don't know exactly their types. They're drawn from a distribution. What if the incumbent is the one who searches for new investor opportunities and conduct an initial evaluation of the potential investments, chooses investment projects to undertake. So basically shareholders have no way to know what is an investment opportunity or not until the manager walks into the office and says, you know what, I have a new investment opportunities. And what, I, what we show is that in the US, if the companies were allowed to freely choose all kinds of securities, the managers would have walked into the shareholders office much more frequently than they currently do. But that's unobservable. The investment managers, the firm's market value as its own is a private control. Again, private control, I don't want to 
waste time on the private control, uh, but, but there is a private benefits of control. So the control rate is a is a must for our 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 uh, results. And the incumbent's ability to extract private benefits depends on efficiency. So some guys are you know more sleazy than the others, and they're able to make more for themselves from the same assessment of the control. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's something of a, in a quality that is between zero to one. Private benefits reduces the farm's market value of dollar for a dollar. The objective functions I, we maximize will will show the objective function. The one thing I want to clarify is that I do not assume absolute. We do not assume absolute control. We can have a, a, a beta less than strictly less than half, which means it's not that it's not possible to take over the farm. But you know our 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 model works if we assume that beta is greater than half as well. You know, so larger shareholder, but is well constrained. This is a critical assumption in our model. I mean, I want to focus your attention to this critical assumption. One is that if you do an expansion, if you do prorata allocation, what is called right issue, then our problem will be solved. So we do not have a problem. So we are assuming that the current management is wealth constrained, means he cannot buy back, buy more shares in the new issue to keep his voting, uh, voting rights intact. So that's an assumption which is important. <laughs> rivals' abilities are unknown. We don't know the rival. I'm thinking about the problem now. I don't know the rival. I'm thinking about should I go for the investment or not? If I have to invest, I can have, I'm forced to right now issue well, only voting shares. So if I voting shares and certain types of rivals come over, there's a chance that I might lose control. That's what I'm, <laughs> I can't read this. That's the problem. I mean, I, I see your point as well. Okay. Okay. So, so the existing shareholders and investors who own the farm, new investors buy securities that a farm issues to finance its new investment. Shareholders are able to you know, influence both corporate objectives, simple majority votes. I mean, you see, all these things can be changed. I can make it super majority votes and all these things. You know, change in control. Each investor outside wants to maximize the value of his or her holding. The rival offers to buy the farm if he values the farm higher than the incumbent in public plus private terms. I, you know, this is mundane, NPV has to be positive, this is the value, I mean, I take a, this is, this is risk neutral world, so essentially, you know, this is zero on an average, PX is concave and differentiable, we need maximum X bar, but I make a critical assumption here as well. I don't look at over investment. So what I assume is that the private benefits and public benefits are maximized at the same X. If private benefits are maximized at an X higher than the public benefits, then we might see uh, overinvestment as a problem as well. So we upfront say, because we want to focus the underinvestment problem, so we maximize at the same level. If it is below, then it's fine, there's no problem. But you know, if it is above, significantly above where public benefits are maximized, then you might see an overinvestment which we haven't considered. I do not believe that's a major problem, but we might discuss about it. This is the timeline. This is the most important thing. The shareholders decide on the type of securities to issue to raise funds for the new investments. So this is, you can think about it in the company chart. Managers decide to amount of invest. He sells new to the raising funds. New project is funded. If not funded at T equal to zero, the investors a company has grabbed the opportunity. So the investor opportunity is one shot game to the farm. If he takes it, takes it. If he doesn't, it's gone. Somebody else takes it. If the rival arrives, if the takeover happens and the rival is in control, otherwise the incumbent retain controls. So the takeover is coming forward looking. I'm deciding before how much X to choose given my charter. If the farm is liquidated, the shareholders get this as dividends, the manager gets BI. Where BI, the subscript I stands for either rival or the incumbent, whoever is in control at that point. This is very important. This is the endogenous, you know, the, the, the control equation. You see, if I vote by this subscript one is really the one voting share. So the existing shares are all one voting. Now I'm adding on to the one voting shares. Now you see that in the denominator, 
of the even the private benefits of control, which is shared in a control contest, n1 plays a role. This is if this is greater, then the incumbent retains control. I signif I simplify this, this algebraic simplification, and I see that this is these are implicit functions of n1 where K1 is initially the incumbent's voting share or outside voting shares. So this proportion is very critical. Change in control occurs when the rival can offer a higher price. Now I'm talking about non-voting. So this zero is saying I, I'm, I'm in funding this investment using non-voting shares. Now you see in the private benefit, there is, there is no N0 because the premium, the takeover premium is only absorbed by the existing shareholders who are the voting shares in the farm. The non-voting shares are not entitled to this. But they are entitled to, by Delaware law, is entitled to entire public benefits that is observable. So this is, this is what will be the, I will only offer to buy the voting shares and I will buy at this price. Again, after simplifying, I see this is the implicit function of kappa, which is the implicit function of the, of the voting shares. This is very important. Where AI is the public quality of a firm, of, a, of the CEO, the incumbent manager. AI is a random variable. AI is the public quality of a potential rival. So that's why it's a random variable. It's drawn from a distribution. BI is the private benefit, private quality of uh, incumbent, whereas BR, which is this, I have solved the BR, BR is essentially an variable, which is the public quality of the potential rival. So the pool of the potential rival relative to my position is important. See, what I say is this, that we can solve for the minimum, given any public quality, I can solve for the minimum private quality that will ensure a change in, con that in uh, not a change in control. Similarly, I can solve, so we, I know that BI has to be between zero and one. So using this upper bounds, I'm assuming a finite support distribution. So basically this manager's qualities are drawn from a bivariate uniform distribution. So I have finite support distribution. I can use the, ex the extreme values to solve for the, uh, the upper bounds of the public quality and lower bounds of the public quality. Now I'm saying this. See, this is important. No matter how, how much game I play, if a really good public quality rival comes up, I will not be able to retain control. So a really good public guy will be able to take over the farm. No matter I issue dual class, I don't issue anything. Similarly, I'm saying this. If a public guy is so lousy that his public quality is lower than this lower bound, he won't be able to take the farm irrespective of my choice of securities. So this figure will explain. I mean, these are, at this hour, uh, this figure is kind of explains these three ranges. See, what I'm saying is this upper range the takeover happens irrespective of the security design. In this lower range, takeover happens, uh, takeover does not happen irrespective of the security design. The culprit is this middle range. This middle range is the culprit. And you see these arrows are basically the securities issued in the future. So if one voting shares are issued, this middle range becomes suppressed. So basically the range over which private benefits play a role become compressed, very low range. But if, if the range over which, if you issue non-voting shares, you are pulling out, you are actually increasing the range over which private benefit plays a role. So the private, the role, see this is critical, these arrow directions are critical. In a non-voting shares, these arrows are actually reducing this efficiency zones. These are efficiency zones. And in the non in the voting share case, actually mutual issuance is increasing the increasing this efficiency zone. These are this upper bound and the lower bound that I talked about. Of course, this is the 
This is the objective function of the manager. This is the probability of retaining control. This is the objective function of the shareholders. They are maximizing by saying, can I choose a chair? Should I allow a zero vote or a one vote share? This is the prob probability. This is the bivariate, you know, the probability of manager retaining control as a function of X, the level of investment he chooses. So he's, remember, he's maximizing this function. And maximizes this function, there are two elements of one. This is an increasing function of X. The dividend that he's going to get to himself is an increasing function of X. But this is, as I'm going to show you, is a decreasing function of X. And this is, private benefit is increasing, but this, because this is decreasing function of X, what can happen is he might actually reduce, by increasing X, he might reduce his expected welfare, in this case, the wealth. I will try. OK. This is, this is the thing. This is fine. This is the, the probability of takeover. This is critical, as I said. This is the implicit function of the x. The x is, x is implied in kappas. And the j's are the voting types. What I'm going to show in the paper is that this, this kappas for non-voting is decreasing function of X, I think it means retaining control is increasing function of X, and for voting, it's decreasing function of X. Now let me go through an example. This will, you know, at this hour, weary hour, it will help you explain. So take, this is a very simplified example. Initial number of shares outstanding is 100. I own incumbent, manager owns 50. Existing farm value, investment opportunity, are, I have defined. These are my investment opportunities. I can have three levels of investment, no investment, level one investment, level two investment. These are the public values. See, these are positive NPV investment. You see 110, 10 cents, 12 cents. It's decreasing return to scale is there, but it's a positive NPV. You see there are some private benefits of control. I'm assuming that the rival is very good. Rival has no private benefits of control. If I assume rival, my, my case will be more supported. So I want to make sure that the rival is drawn from a distribution where there is no private benefits. This is my, my holding was 50%, so there is no chance of a takeover because takeover needs 50 plus one. There's no chance of a takeover without any investment. So the probability I retain, if I don't do any investment, is, is 100% or zero chance of a takeover. If we take over, the probability goes down. So if I invest level one, probability goes down by 5%. And if I invest two, probability goes down by 21%. If I use non-voting shares to do the investment, this is my owner's process. So there is no change in the retained probability of control. This is very important, this table. This table, I'm doing the cal I've shown you the calculations here. It's essentially the manager's payoff and the outside shareholder's payoff. So this is the probability that the managers retain control with the NPV, and this is the chance that a takeover happens, and this is the NPV if the rival takes control. So this is the expected value, public value. Of course, I'm dividing the expected private value into two parts. That's why they get half of it, because 50% is the incumbent's ownership. So the incumbent gets 50% of this, plus, plus the private benefits. Plus the private benefits, which is this. So you see, it's very clear that the manager will not go down to, from one to two. Why the manager will not go down from 1 to 2? Because his welfare goes down from 1.299 to 1.2817. So he will get stuck. Even though the shareholders wants to increase the outside payoff, shareholders want the payoff to increase, uh, but the investment to increase, because they are better off, 1.052 to 1.684. But what happens is, this is, this does not, if the, if the manager chooses the investment level, so the manager never 
chooses this. The manager always will choose one, whereas it is optimal for the shareholders to do two. Now you see, if you do the non-voting shares, the manager has higher, with two, he has 1.33, whereas with one, he has 1.31, so you'll choose the uh, level two investment. And the shareholders are also better off. The shareholders are also better off with, uh, with two. But look at this, the default, this is very important. Look at the, man, the shareholders, even if the same level of investment, with the same level of investment, the shareholders are better off with voting shares issued than non-voting shares issued. This is what Grossman and Hardy say, this is what Harrison Ravi is saying. So if you control the same level of investment, you observe that the shareholders are better off with voting shares. But the unobservable is that you will have stuck at one. The manager will report that the investor level is one. And the manager reports one the investor level is one, then the shareholders are worse off. By allowing the manager not to issue the non-voting shares, the managers, the shareholders are worse off. They're stuck at 1.052, whereas they could have achieved 1.06. So one of the, you know, the concerns that I have seen in you know, Alex Edmonds has discussed this paper before and his question was, can we do a contractual solution to this problem? And the answer is, so I modified my example and my model to show that that might be at least, see, I'm not saying contractual solution is not possible. That's, you know, that will be uh, something extraordinary. But what I'm saying, this example, you see the contractual solution is not possible because the gain of the shareholders is actually less than the loss of the manager. So in order to compensate the manager, the gain of the shareholder must be at least equal to what the shareholders, uh, what the manager is losing. So look at the manager is losing. This two differences is the manager's loss. And the, this two differences is the shareholder's gain. So this difference is bigger than this difference. The shareholders cannot make the manager compensate. So if they are better off moving from this place to this place, where they're trading up 0 0.0084 for a higher level than higher level of investment, which is 1.052 to moving to 1.06, and you don't need any in, you know, incentive to managers to invest. So this is basically I show in my, you know, my, my results that you know, where you will. Now if the, if the insider's ownership, the manager's ownership goes up above a certain level, he's hurting himself by underinvesting. So now underinvesting is not a problem. And if underinvestment is not a problem, you are better off with the Grossman Hart result that you stick to one vote, one share rule. You stick to one share, one, share, one vote rule. So if investment is a concern, so this is saying that manager owns a lot. So every dollar he under invests, he's hurting himself 40 cents. If you hurt himself 40 cents, his expected gain from the private benefit is not big enough to compensate him. So it critically depends on the insider ownership. In fact, one of the counterintuitive results in our model is that if you don't own any shares, you never under invest. So one word, one share is always optimal. Because see, you're, com you're coming from this possibility to control your, your uh, diversity of control rights. And if you don't own to begin with, you cannot have that incentive. So you will never underinvest. And if you don't underinvest, shareholders are better off restricting you. So why do you think you know, so many few IPOs, even they are allowed to do, so many few IPOs uh, issue dual class shares, and you know, 15%, 85% choose not to even if they could have. Because I'm saying it's an indulgence choice. So those who choose, according to my model, are optimally choosing. But many managers will, I'll show you, there's a very particular condition when the shareholders will allow. See, this is the underinvestment ratio. I'm done. This is the underinvestment ratio. And this underinvestment ratio is critical for the actual A to happen. Thank you.